Okay, well, welcome to another episode of the uh, Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Barlin. We have a returning guest today, uh, my good friend, Craig Foster. Uh, before we go into his presentation, which has a lot of contemporary currency because of a certain TV series that's on the air at the moment, um, just a few announcements. Of course, we're on Patreon at Scriptural Mormonism, PayPal at Irish LDS. Uh, there's been some, albeit very slow, progress with my uh, visa, so hopefully I will be states-wise in the next few months, fingers crossed. So um, prayers, well wishes, and sacrifices and all that, whatever uh, suits uh, will be most appreciated. Um, hopefully I'll have some updates soon. And we have a few guests in the uh, can, um, if you will, um, just trying to sort out some dates. Um, Errol Ami, who's a walking dictionary of all things patristics. Hopefully we'll be coming on in the next few weeks to discuss the theology of one Clement, an early Christian text, as well as the ecclesiology of early Rome in the first and second centuries. Uh, Carl Cranny, uh, hopefully he'll be coming on soon as well to discuss his doctoral dissertation. And I've reached out a couple others as well, like Nathaniel Givens and others. So hopefully in the next few weeks and few months, we'll have um, those guests on. Um, if you have any suggestions or guests or you yourself want to come on, uh, drop me an email at scripturalmormonism at gmail.com and I'll consider it. So uh, with that as the um, introduction, as I said, we have Craig Foster. So um, he appeared on episode two discussing the charge of pedophilia against Joseph Smith. And that was a very interesting uh, discussion about that topic. And uh, we have him on again today. So uh, Craig, um, pleasure, uh, pleasure to have you on again. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be on again. Um, I know we had an introduction to you a couple of weeks ago when you appeared on episode two. So um, do you have uh, any uh, updates as to any projects you're currently working on or any presentations you'll be giving in the near future? Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation at the Mormon History Association Conference in June. Uh, that will be held in Logan. And... Um, uh, it's on. Uh, it's going to be about Gladys Knight and her odyssey of uh, from being a Baptist to a Catholic to then Mormonism and uh, the influence that she has had. And uh, then I'll be giving a presentation actually at Sunstone this year um, on um, uh, my interaction with fundamentalists over the years and. Um, the impact that it's made on me, and hopefully I've made on some of them. And um, then uh, uh, I will be at John Whitmer, whether I, I'm presenting or not, I don't know, but I'll be at the John Whitmer Historical Association Conference in Independence in September. Oh, that sounds interesting. And hopefully we can actually have you on in, uh, in a future episode to discuss fundamentalism. Um, you did co-author a book on the topic entitled American, uh, was it American Fundamentalism, is it? Yes, American yeah. Fundamentalism. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, which is a very good introduction to um, Mormon fundamentalist groups with Marianne Watson, um, who uh, was, or at least is, a member of the AUB. Um, yes. Yeah. So for those who uh, are wondering about a good introduction to Mormon fundamentalism, in terms of uh, scholar research, not yourself joining, uh, that would be a very good book. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, today, um, so what is the topic you will be presenting on today, Craig? And why do you think it, especially today, it has a lot of uh, importance in contemporary currency? Well, I'm going to be talking about uh, the culture of violence. Um, the, the so-called Mormon culture of violence. And um, I'm, I'm well known for a couple of things, one of which is polygamy, uh, obviously. Uh, but and, and for those who are listening, in terms of research. Research, not, research, not, not uh, no. <laughs> Just research. Um, uh, but I'm also uh, fairly well known for violence. Just research. Um and because I have, over the years, I've done quite a bit of research on um, aspects of culture of violence. And, um, and so what I wanted to do was to address the, uh, uh, the so-called Mormon culture of violence, uh, particularly in relation to uh, claims that, um, that uh, we come from a violent background, um, and uh, be, under the banner of heaven, the book, as well as the series that is presently on, uh, presently available at Hulu, as well as other places, I would assume, um, 
the, uh, they, they address that to a degree, or at least they, they, they claim that, um, that we have a heritage of violence. And so what I want to do is to kind of take a look at that and put it within the greater um, uh, American historical context. Okay, well, it sounds like it's going to be a very fascinating uh, interview so um, and presentation. So if you want, I'll let you uh, share your screen and I'll just turn yes. off my video and I'll mute myself. But if there's any issues, I'll let you know. So, All right. Um, okay, let's see. There we go. And... Okay, so um, basically uh, the the presentation is, was there a Mormon culture of violence? And um, very quickly, I just want to explain. Um, yeah, I've, I've published several articles over the years, uh, the Butler murder of April 1869, a look at extra legal punishment in Utah, the sensational murder of James R. Hay and trial of Peter Mortensen, death to seducers, examples of Latter-day Saint-led extra-legal justice in historical context. And uh, then my most recent is uh, The Wrath of a Wronged Woman, Ways 19th Century Women Punished Wrongdoers. So um, I, I do come at this after uh, a couple of decades, well, over a couple of decades of doing research and looking at um, uh, thousands of newspaper articles from the time period, and um, uh, as well as other literature, etc. All right, so D. Michael Quinn, um, it, a number of years ago, published an article, The Culture of Violence in Joseph Smith's Mormonism. And in that he says, quote, unlike other American religious denominations, the church militant was a literal fact in Mormonism, not just a symbolic slogan. And John Krakauer took up that, uh, uh, that theme also in his book, Under the Banner of Heaven, to which I actually responded um, uh, back in, um, it, his book was published in 2003 and mine came out in January of uh, 2004, uh, titled uh, Doing Violence to Journalistic Integrity, uh, because I felt that um, his book uh, really did do violence to journalistic integrity, and, and we'll, we'll get on that in a moment. And then, of course, we have uh, the latest, which is um, Under the Banner of Heaven, which is the TV series and um, inspired by John Krakauer's true crime bestseller. And I can see why they would say inspired by, because um, there's not a lot of uh, resemblance to Krakauer's book, at least so far. I've only seen a couple of ep episodes, but uh, they, they've, they've gone in their own direction to a great degree. But they, too, make uh, claims that, uh, that uh, you know, we have a violent heritage. The character of Alan Lafferty in the, uh, in the series says, this faith, our faith, breeds dangerous men. And, um, you know, which, of course, suggests that because of a violent heritage that uh, uh, members of the church today have this violent strain within them. So uh, Quinn also said in the same article, Mormonism was a violent subculture within a violent national culture. And um, I'm not going to argue about the fact that there was a strain of violence within American culture uh, that uh, was reflected in 19th century culture but I do argue with the with how violent uh, Mormonism was in relation to uh, the the other groups of people around them. And so my question is: Was it 
and is it? Uh, was it really that violent and is it still violent today because of this heritage? Was Mormonism and Mormon Utah more violent than the rest of America? And there's a quote from um, David T. Cartwright in Violent Land, uh, Single Man and Social Disorder from the Frontier to the Inner City, really interesting book. Quote, American society, or at any rate, a conspicuous part of it, has been tumultuous from the very beginning of European colonization. 17th century Virginia was a disorderly place, though Massachusetts Bay Colony was not. Violence in America has long manifested this uneven quality. Some regions, such as the South and the frontier and urban ghettos, have experienced very high levels of violence and disorder, while others, such as rural New England or Mormon Utah, have been far more tranquil places. And I'm going to place the emphasis there that Mormon Utah was considered by this uh, scholar a far more tranquil place. And I've also seen other Western scholars uh, comment on the fact that while um, there were examples of extra legal justice, vigilante action, um, and, and just a culture of violence in surrounding territories, Utah, while it did have, uh, certainly had examples of it, was far less violent than um, other places like uh, Arizona, Colorado, etc. Uh, Scott Thomas in Violence Across the Land, Vigilantism and Extra Legal Justice in Utah Territory wrote, quote, it is clear that in the West, vigilantism did not arise in an historical vacuum. Not until the waning of the Gilded Age did vigilantism begin to lose favor among the masses of the West, end quote. And, um, and you can certainly see that in, um, in uh, uh, criminal court proceedings, but also particularly in reading the newspapers of the 19th century. And um, in the 19th century, uh, 19th century America, the idea of, um, of honor as, quote, honor was a defining concept for most Americans holding particular sway in the South and West, end quote, an aspect of honor was that no man had the duty to retreat when confronted in a threatening way. So duty to retreat versus no duty to retreat. Um, English law uh, stated that, that a person, when confronted in a threatening way, by law had to try to retreat. Um, and that was picked up in Canadian law, other countries. But in America, um, back in the 19th century, across America, and even today in some states, there is what is referred to as no duty to retreat. In other words, if, con if confronted in a threatening way, a person has the right to respond to whatever level of violence they need to, to protect themselves or, or people around them. So in fact, in some cases, threats against a person were considered a question of honor. And in these serious cases, quote, violence against the offender was often the only way to restore lost honor, end quote. So not only in the 19th century was there this uh, no duty to re retreat, in, uh, at least within the culture, there was the idea that if a person did not respond with as violent or more violent of a response, then they had lost honor. So violence was expressed through both legal and extra legal ways. And I'm focusing here on the extra legal ways that would involve beating, 
burning, meaning burning of um, of a building, burning of a of a press. If if they felt that the newspaper had um, had wronged them or or was causing trouble, um, so burning in those different ways, castration, destruction, destruction of a press, destruction of a building, uh, such as mobs who wanted to clean up the town would uh, destroy brothels, um, literally destroy them, burn them down or whatever else. Uh, ducking or dunking uh, uh, people into uh, ponds or, or rivers. Egg, egging and other uh, ways of pelting people like with uh, uh, vegetables, rotten vegetables. Uh, lynching, mobbing, being ordered out, being ridden on a rail, literally putting the person on a, on a long post and uh, carrying them around uh, the town or wherever they were uh, would, was, was a way of humiliating them, humiliating the person that they were making ride the rail, uh, ride on a rail. Shooting, stabbing, tarring and feathering and whipping. Those were all different ways of um, different types of extra legal violence. An important factor in the study of extra legal violence in Utah comes from determining the motive and means. Examinations of hierarchical discourse indicates that much of the fiery speech from the leadership was merely rhetorical weaponry to keep enemies at bay. And I put this quote in because um, uh, Michael Quinn, as well as John Krakauer, and uh, the series has at least alluded to the idea that um, that early Latter-day Saint leadership, that they whipped people up into a frenzy uh, uh, because of the um, the uh, speeches and, that they gave, and that they uh, basically gave a carte blanche to violence um, in these talks, uh, encouraging things like um, blood atonement and and um, other um, violent acts, and and really um, the uh, some of the talks that uh, early leaders like Brigham Young gave. I do seem really um, quite violent um, and and um, extreme in talking, but it was more of a rhetorical weapon than uh, actually saying, "Yeah, go do exactly what I'm saying." And um, uh, Ronald W. Walker, uh, he um, he wrote uh, published an article back in 1983. An excellent article from Sunstone titled Raining Pitchforks, Brigham Young is Preacher. And in that, um, uh, Ron Walker argued that Brigham Young and other early church leaders used harsh language that was like having, quote, it raining pitchforks, tines downwards, end quote, and that the sermons were akin to peals of thunder. But they were used, once again, more as a rhetorical device rather than they a carte blanche to commit blood atonement and other forms of holy violence. Now, I uh, have mentioned that there were examples of extra legal justice in Utah. And I wanted to give you some um, examples of what took place over um, basically from 1847 to 19. Well, actually, uh, 1903. Um, so that's a long period. There were beatings for various reasons, um, some dealing with extra legal violence, some just uh, um, uh, problems between um, um, Mormons and uh, the military that had been sent out to watch them. Um, there were a couple of cases of castration for incest and seduction. There was a near lynching for incest and that actually took place in Corinne, which was a hell on wheels, um, meaning it was a railroad town and, and uh, there weren't, uh, 
if there were any Mormons there, there were very few. It was, it was a non-Mormon town. Um, there was a lynching for rape and murder, um, uh, mobbing for various reasons, shooting for adultery and seduction, just a couple of them, tarring and feathering for rape, only one incident that I'm aware of, and one incident of uh, tarring and feathering for seduction. There were incidents of whipping for insult, slander, other reasons. And then um, one case of, um, and this was again in a non-Mormon town, whipping and the person was ordered out uh, of the town and out of the territory uh, because of incest. All right, so then does that mean was Mormonism and Mormon Utah really more violent than the rest of America? And um, what I have uh, now um, are some examples of violence among other American religious groups. Now, a lot of these are basically colloquial. I mean, um, there's, there's no statistics there. But these are based on both articles discussing them, uh, as well as newspaper articles from the time period. And so it's kind of a mix of that. We'll start with Baptists. So the Baptists, um, you know, have often, um, often been scenes, there have often been scenes of conflict, usually verbal, but sometimes violent among predominant Southern religious groups of which the Baptists were the most predominant. Um, quote, the bloody outcome of the struggle, and this was talking about a murder that took place, may testify to the underlying violent elements in both emotional Southern religion and the contemporary frontier culture um, uh, back in the um, 1890s. Uh, a gentleman with the last name of Brand published um, a number of insulting articles about the Baptists and about Baptist-run Baylor University in Texas. He ended up being um, uh, beaten and um, threatened to, to, uh, to be lynched. He didn't give up and eventually he was killed. Um, and so that's what uh, this was about. Then um, here are some examples from uh, newspapers in 1883. The annual camp meeting at Bethel uh, Church in Cabarrus County, North Carolina, broke up in a row. The row was between Reverend Edwards and his supporters and Reverend Jones and his supporters. And then another one, Reverend Mr. Everts and Reverend Dr. Parker got into a fight with each other at the South Baptist Church in Hartford, Connecticut that led to fisticuffs in the church particularly between the two preachers who beat each other, tore out hair, and fell into the font and tried to drown each other. Um, it was at the time of the baptism uh, that was being taken place uh, there. Um, and and I, I like these two examples because one was down in the south, the other one was up in uh, New England. And as you can see, um, it, uh, it really didn't matter where there, these incidents took place all over uh, America, with obviously more of them being down in the south and, and on the frontier, but still there were plenty of examples in other places. The Reverend Hezekiah Altop, a Baptist preacher who had, quote, been conducting himself in a most licentious manner with members of his flock, end quote, was taken out and whipped and castrated by his neighbors and members of his congregation. Um, and that was as late as 1886, that something that violent took place. And then we have another example, the Reverend R.T. Huffman, pastor of the First Colored Baptist Church in Nashville, was mobbed by members of his congregation because he was accused of improprieties toward women of his church. Uh, he was able to get away from them, though, so did uh, did not receive any bodily harm. And then the Frank Franklin College, a Baptist uh, college in uh, Franklin, oops, uh, went 
in Franklin, uh, they had they witnessed a large fight that turned into a bloody riot uh, um, between the students at the college. The fight was between the seniors and sophomores on one side and juniors and freshmen on the other. And um, over 100 students were involved, quote, heads were broken, faces cut, and blood flowed freely, end quote. And that was in 1898. So as you can see, um, that it continued, you know, up uh, to a period of time. Um, oh, geez, I keep, sorry. All right. So here are two articles dealing with Catholics. Serious trouble is feared in Newark, New Jersey, from the Roman Catholics who have threatened to mob the Baptist Church and its members because their minister had baptized a Catholic girl. And uh, then there was a fight among two Catholic congregations for the possession of a, of a church um, uh, of a church uh, in Plymouth, Pennsylvania. The two congregations got into a fierce fight and people, including police and the, and the chief of police, were injured in that fight. Okay, Dutch Reformed Church. And I, I might say with the Catholics, there actually have been a number of books written regarding um, violence between Catholics and Protestants and of Protestants against Catholics in America. The history of that was long and um, really quite bloody with uh, very large riots taking place. So I didn't want to go into all of that uh, too much time, but I just wanted to mention uh, that. Dutch Reformed Church, this took place in New York City. The church on Forsyth Street was the scene of, quote, the most disgraceful riots, rows, and fisticuffs on Sunday that ever graced a groggery, uh, end quote, meaning that, um, that even um, bar fights, <laughs> um, it was kind of um, uh, on, on par with, the, with bar fights. The congregation was divided over the minister and whether the preaching should be in Dutch or in a combination of Dutch and English. And it came to fighting, and there were, quote, bloody noses, ragged coats, split pantaloons, smashed bonnets, torn frocks, and black eyes, end quote. The German Protestant church in New Orleans, um, there was a minority supporting the minister and the majority bitterly opposing him and forbidding him to officiate. And when he entered the church to do so, the Women in the congregation attacked him with cowhides, that would be small whips or riding crops, uh, pepper, salt, flour, and gypsum, and he was forced to flee from the church. Methodists. Eli Farmer, an antebellum Methodist clergyman, not only preached violence, but also practiced it. In the mid-1830s, he confronted an antagonistic neighbor and thrashed him. The man continued verbally uh, to verbally abuse Farmer, who uh, finally, quote, caught him by the throat and running him against a fence, choked him till his tongue protruded and he began to beg, end quote. Farmer, another 19th century circuit riding Methodist clergyman from Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, included many similar boastful and at times gory accounts of their willingness and ability to dish out physical beatings to various antagonists. And that's from uh, choked him till his tongue protruded, violence the code of honor, and Methodist clergy in the antebellum Ohio Valley. These early Methodist clergymen, quote, believed that violence was a proper response to challenges to one's manhood and public reputation, end quote. This reflected the teachings of early Methodist minister and John Wesley's confidant, John Fletcher's teaching that, quote, the kingdom of heaven permits certain kinds of violence, end quote. The concept of public reputation and honor leading to violence extended to the pulpit. 
Francis Asbury of the Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States, having committed to, quote, either fight or die, end quote, filled his published memoirs with accounts of, quote, Satan's constant assaults, end quote, and, and how he took care of those assaults, uh, usually in a rather violent way. Another Methodist clergyman, Peter Cartwright, told about how some Latter-day Saints had disrupted a camp meeting over which he presided. He ordered them out yelling, quote, don't show your face here again, nor are one of the Mormons. If you do, you will get Lynch's law. Uh, in short, the preacher threatened to kill any saints who dared to show their faces at a Methodist meeting, end quote. And then um, Peter Cartwright, uh, he was known to be combative, even violent in the course of his circuit writing duties because uh, the, quote, reminiscences of his early career in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Ohio are seemingly little more than a succession of battles with evangelical rivals of whom Baptists are the principal foe, end quote. Then the uh, couple of newspapers from uh, uh, the 1880s, the Reverend B. Jenkins of Mansfield, Louisiana, having, it is said, reason to believe that the Reverend J. Dane Bowden, president of Mansfield College, had seduced a young lady friend of his, shot Bowden on sight on the 16th of June, putting six bullets in his body. Both were ministers of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then the congregation of Reverend M. Delos uh, want to tar and feather him as he told them he would be breathing when a majority of his congregation were in hell. Sadly, the paper did not follow up whether the tarring and feathering actually took place. All right, Presbyterians, we're getting toward the end, I promise. Um, Frontier Presbyterian minister James fin Finley, quote, once threatened to horsewhip a man who talked in a meeting, end quote. And in 1848, this same James Finley was presiding at a quarterly meeting in Xenia, Ohio, when a Democratic congressman began haranguing him from the audience. Finley told the man to sit down and be quiet. The congressman, quote, refused and insisted on his right to speak, end quote, to which, quote, Finley grabbed a large hickory cane, left the pulpit and threatening to bludgeon him, end quote. On Sunday, the 10th of uh, August, 1834, Presbyterian uh, turned Congregationalist preacher Lyman Beecher uh, practiced um, or preached, excuse me, um, an anti Catholic, uh, three anti Catholic sermons in three different uh, churches. All the churches were filled beyond capacity, and each audience was treated to a barrage of denunciations of the Pope, Rome, and Catholicism. Other congregational clergy in and around Boston followed Beecher's uh, lead that day, and some directly denounced the Ursuline convent uh, that um, was in Charlestown, Massachusetts. In fact, one preacher urged his listeners to attack the convent, saying, quote, um, leave not one stone unturned of that, um, of that cursed nunnery, that prostitute female virtue and liberty under the garb of holy religion, end quote. These anti-Catholic sermons of Lyman Beecher, particularly his Sunday evening sermon uh, titled The Devil and the Pope of Rome, um, as well as the sermons of other ministers, were said to have encouraged an angry mob to burn the Ursuline convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts, the very next evening. Okay. And then just a couple of other examples, uh, really quick ones. The heart, there was a hardened Missouri uh, preacher who thrashed a newspaper man a few days ago, justified it by quoting scripture, and then another one stated, a Donovan County, Kansas preacher named Benson 
thrashed three fellows who were disturbing the church services. So what does this mean? Well, you know, um, I could say, well, see, everyone did it. And that is what I'm going to say in a moment. But um, that does not excuse cases of Mormon-related violence, especially ones that uh, uh, were particularly horrific, um, like the Mountain Meadow Massacre. And, and in no way uh, am I trying to justify those examples of violence. Um, but what I am trying to say that there was not a culture of violence within Mormonism that was more violent than other 19th century American religions, as uh, we can see from examples there. Uh, in fact, in many ways, Mormon Utah was less violent than most other sections of the United States, and that was because of the influence of the church. You know, the, uh, um, we had a lot of violent people and um, uh, that had that from the culture in which they had been raised, and that did continue in Utah, but to actually to a much lesser extent than in um, other parts of the country. So in response to uh, Mike Quinn, who I knew and, um, and considered a good friend, um, in response to John Krakauer's Under the Banner of Heaven, and uh, in response to the series that we have uh, now with the same title, uh, was there a Mormon culture of violence that, that was worse than uh, those around them? No. Were there examples of violence that happened within Mormonism? Yes, but it certainly was not to the extent that uh, some people try to portray it. And I'll, um, I'll uh, stop uh, sharing now. And well, um, that was really interesting. I do appreciate the uh, obvious time you put into that. I was like paying attention, not just to like the quotes, but also the sources. I noticed like a lot came from 19th century newspapers. And believe me, it takes a lot of time, even with the internet, to actually find a lot of those sources on archives and stuff like that. So um, it, yeah. it has taken yeah. years, actually, to compile. I have two large file uh, drawers. It's a fun topic. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, because, like, I know for like my job, um, I have to like try and find like articles from, like, say, the Desert News from the 19th century and other newspapers from, like, say, Chicago. And it's not easy with the internet. So I can just imagine, like, when you were starting doing this. Um, so I do appreciate the great the amount of time and care you've taken into this, and hopefully others will appreciate it and um, learn from it as well. Um, very informative. Um, so if someone were um, and. But if, say, if someone were, like, say, strapped for time and they were, say, like, Craig, uh, this is all great information. I'd like to delve a bit more. But, like, if you could, like, maybe whittle down, like, say, if you could recommend maybe one or two books or one or two articles that you would consider to be must-reads. Not necessarily, like, maybe on, say, the issue of, like, say, Mormon culture of violence and or general American history of violence, if you will. Uh, what, well, what I, would, um, I would certainly recommend uh, Patrick Mason's book, um, Patrick Q. Mason. Um, and my mind just went blank. So um, I will uh, very quickly um, check. <laughs> um, uh, that's embarrassing. Um, uh, the, um, there is, uh, okay, I know it's coming up. Sorry. Here we go. Patrick Q. Mason, The Mormon Menace, Violence and Anti-Mormonism in the Postbellum South. Uh, which was published in 2011. Um, I would recommend that. I would, uh, uh, not trying to be arrogant here, but I would recommend um, uh, my article, uh, Death to Seducers, Examples of Latter-day Saint-led Extra-Legal Justice in Historical Context. That's from Interpreter, a journal of Latter-day Saint Faith and Scholarship from 2020. And um, to, to a much lesser extent, uh, but still 
interesting. Uh, the Butler murder of April 1869, a look at extra legal punishment in Utah. That was originally in Mormon historical studies, but uh, you can find that online, if I remember correctly, a couple of ways. So if you typed in Craig L. Foster, the Butler murder of April 1869, you should be able to find that also, even though it's from the fall of 2001. Um, and I might add, um, the um, that one, um, I wrote that for a personal reason. Um, the, uh, the Butler murder of 1869, what happened was that the railroad was being built uh, through Utah, and they, had, they uh, had built the railroad through Ogden, and then were veering up to the northwest, uh, where they eventually, the railroads met at Promontory um, and uh, there in northern Utah. But as they as they veered to the northwest, just out of Ogden, but the railroad crossed just a little corner of my great grandfather's land. His name was William Butler, and um, he uh, um, all kinds of interesting people would um, would hang around the railroad um, as it was being built. Uh, earlier, I mentioned Corinne being a hell on wheels. That was the name of, of the camp, of the little towns that were set up. They were known as hell on wheels because they would just keep moving along with um, the railroad. And, um, and so you had all kinds of, um, of uh, you, you know, you had merchants, you had gamblers, you had prostitutes, you had uh, just all kinds of riffraff. And uh, one of the guys that was uh, along with the railroad took an interest in um, uh, a couple of my great grandfather's wives. Um, yes, he was a polygamist. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, this guy, obviously, this one uh, day came with the idea of, of attacking and raping uh, this uh, one wife. Uh, he picked up a hatchet uh, when she confronted him and, you know, kind of fought back and he started attacking her. Two of her children came to help her and he swung the uh, hatchet around and uh, killed uh, one of the children, a little girl. And the, the uh, boy took off running um, and went to a neighbor's to let them know what had happened. Um, and... Um, the uh, the wife was seriously injured. They thought she was going to die. She she actually lived, but um, the little girl died. But um, the townspeople started chasing this guy, and and you know, violent Utah, the old West. Only one person had a gun on them. Uh, one man had a pistol in a, host, a holster because he had been out riding and was just coming back. So he fired a couple of shots at the guy, but missed him. Um, the, the people were chasing him. My great grandfather, they had got him. He chased him down and they, um, uh, they were in the river bottoms of the Weber River. They fought, the guy had a knife. My great grandfather got the knife away from him and stabbed him and thought he had killed him. He went back and said to a couple of the townspeople, including the one guy with the, with the pistol, um, I, I think I killed him. They went to where he had been, but he had moved about 100 yards or so, kind of a little trail of blood there. Um, and um, and the, uh, the guy uh, handed the pistol to my great-grandfather and said to him, make it sure, Butler, I only have one bullet left. And... Um, and my great grandfather made it sure he shot him in the head and killed him, and uh, he then went and turned himself into the sheriff, and the sheriff said, "I heard what happened. You did the right thing. Go on home to your family." <laughs> and um, the next day, uh, I think it was the next day, might have been two days later, there was an inquest that lasted like thirty minutes at the most, and they all said, "Yep, you did the right thing." 
And, um, and that was it. So I wrote about that. And then I wrote about other examples of extra legal justice. And that's actually what kind of got me on the topic. Oh, no, that sounds very fascinating. I'll have to try to track down the article now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as you said, like, say, the portrait, you think of, like, say, the Wall West, or, like, say, reading something by, say, Richard Abane, sort of Tanners, you kind of think, like, blood flowed in Utah, left, right, and center, you know. But right. you know, as you study the sources, that's an exaggeration. Like, yes. So, you know, Utah wasn't actually as bad as, like, the other uh, territories and states of the 19th century. No, it really wasn't. And, um, um, you know, once again, that does not condone the examples of extra legal justice. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does. Although I do think my great grandfather like did the anomaly. right thing. I'm sorry. What? Oh, it definitely does. Though historically, just speaking, situate the events and like show it's yeah. an anomaly. It wasn't caused by Mormonism or Brigham Young. Um, it was part of the cultural milieu of the time, if you will. It, it really was. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Um, so, um, do you have any other sources you would recommend, or like, uh, uh, for? Um... Well, there's some um, uh, the. Um, uh, and I don't know how available this is. I, I think it actually might be fairly available. Uh, but the um, if someone really wanted to uh, to get into uh, the um, reading about uh, vigilantism and extra legal justice in Utah Territory, that would be Scott K. Thomas. This was his dissertation. Um, titled Violence Across the Land, Vigilantism and Extra Legal Justice in Utah Territory. It was from Brigham Young University uh, in 2010. Um, and it's really quite good uh, and very, very detailed. So uh, that, uh, that might be another uh, one to read. If, if people were just interested in um, extra legal justice and culture of violence in general, um, uh, then there are a couple of um, a couple of uh, authors that um, are really that I would really really recommend, and I'll try to find um, their titles um, uh, hopefully fairly quickly. Um, Maxwell. no, that's fine because like, uh, that's a very informative presentation. And Maxwell Brown was one. I can't think of his first name. I think it's Robert Maxwell Brown, but, uh, he was, um, he was an author and then, uh, then Bertram, um, let's see if I have that. Yes. Bertram. Oh, Bertram Wyatt Brown. Sorry. See, I even got that off. Um, and, um, he, uh, his, um, his work is um, Bertram uh, Wyatt Brown, and I cannot think of the other author's name, sorry. Uh, but um, they both have done quite a bit. Um, I'll send that to you, um, and, and then you can um, uh, post, uh, the, you know, the, the names. But uh, um, Bertram Wyatt Brown and... Um, the other one has Maxwell in his name, and um, and they both have done some fantastic work dealing with culture of violence in America. Um, but but Mormon related, I, I think I've given the ones that that I think are really pretty good. Oh no, that's perfect because like um, your presentation was very informative, and I'm sure like there might be some people out there like say you know this is good, and like I want to delve a bit more into like in these specifics. So uh, that's perfect. I appreciate that. Well, um, as I said, like um, uh, I do appreciate the uh, great time and uh, research uh, that has uh, gone into your presentation, um, and hopefully we can actually have you on again on the near future to discuss maybe this topic in some in some other aspects, but as well maybe have you on for an episode or two on um, modern uh, Mormon fundamentalism and polygamy. Um, as I said, like you did write the uh, book um, American Polygamy with uh, Marianne Watson. Um, which, yes, you know she's I, she's an she's an insider to a fundamentalist group. You're an outsider, and as someone who has a exactly. degree in anthropology, I love the insider outsider working together. It's always, and when uh, we approached it, we sat down and um, and said, uh, "Yeah, we talked." And I said, "Yeah, I I don't believe the Woolies story. Um, you, you know where they say they have 
their uh, authority from. And she goes, I know, but I do believe it. I said, I know. And I said, I am going to approach uh, um, your story respectfully. And she said, and I'll approach the church respectfully. <laughs> and, and that's how we did it. <laughs> and, and it really came out. I mean, I actually have a review on Amazon. I think you've seen it uh, where I did. Yes. It's, it's very balanced. So like uh, for those who want a book on a very controversial topic, I think that would be a good one. And Brian Hills is a very good one as well. Um, Modern Political Absolutely. And Fundamentalism uh, by Greg Coford, 2006. So, yep. um, but yeah, we definitely should have you on because you also have the other book, the uh, volume three of the uh, three volume series, you and Newell Brinhurst edited as well. So um, I I'm sure like maybe like would love to have you on for like maybe one or two or even three episodes on Mormon fundamentalism, you know, its history and its theologies and so forth. So well, I'd be glad uh, to do that. Yeah. So yeah. we'll definitely, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be in contact about that. So something to look okay. forward to. Uh, but again, like I do greatly appreciate the great work you've done and uh, hopefully uh, many others will find this uh, presentation be informative when it's on YouTube uh, later today. So um, thank you again, Craig. I greatly appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. And for those who are listening, um, hopefully you enjoyed this episode as I did. And until then, um, until next time, take care and uh, God bless.